Grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want to teach this morning on the subject entitled The Permanence, The Preeminence, excuse me, The Preeminence of Love. Now, before Mother's Day, I taught on this very same passage only out of the first three verses. I'm going to teach out of verses 8 through 13 today on the preeminence of love. While you're turning there, let me just make this statement. For those of you that are Old Testament scholars or understand anything about the Old Testament, you will know that what God prescribed for the children of Israel to come and worship Him, it was His desire for all of them to have access. Uh -huh. But if you remember at Mount Sinai, it says that when they saw the smoke and the thunder and the lightning and the dark clouds, they were nervous and they says, uh, we can't do this. It's too scary for us. Moses, you go, you be the intermediary. It was never God's intent. It was always God's intent that we'd all have access. Right. So Moses went and was the mediator. Then we know he instituted what we call the priestly line. Remember the Aaronic and the priestly line that come through the Levites? And then only the high priest could go into the very, very, the very presence of God once a year. Now, it was significant when he went into the Holy of Holies. He went in to atone for the people for the whole previous year. And when he went in, he would be jingling around in there doing his duties because on the hem of his robe was a, was a robe, and at the bottom of it was little tinker bells. You know, little bells, tingle, 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 tingle. Now, my dog, Allie, she has her... Around her neck, she has uh, a chain. Well, it's not a chain. It's really a, it's like a pink band that goes around her neck because we want everybody to know she's a girl, right? So she has that, but she has her dog tags and her shots on there. And so whenever she's running, I'm a little hollow, so if you could base me up, that would be awesome. Maybe bring me down a bit because I, I feel I might get loud. So anyway, um, so what happens is she jingles. We know she's coming. We can hear her jingling, jingle, 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 jingle. We know when Allie's around. There's no hiding it. Now, any of you ever milk cows? Anybody ever been on the farm, heard cows? Yeah, yeah. And you ever heard a cow with a bell on it? Clang, 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 clang. You know the, where the cow was because of the clanging of the bell. I'm going somewhere with this, so stay with me, all right? <laughs> so God said to the children of Israel and specifically to Moses when he gave him the commandments and all the laws and the prescription of how to worship him and how to put the temple together and all of the things that were to go into it, he says that you're to wear this robe and when you go in, there's going to be bells on it and they're going to be tinkling so that we know that you're alive. Yep. Now, whether you know this or not, when the children of Israel went in to spy out the promised land, they brought back some of the fruit of the land. They brought back these huge grapes, and they brought back pomegranates. So the bells were representative of the huge grapes. There were pomegranates that were spaced in between. You say, what is that significant of? It's very significant because I believe everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of that which is being fulfilled in the New yes. So the priest upon his robe, and by the way, did you all know you are New Testament priests? Right. Look at somebody say, he's talking to you right now. So everybody that's born again, redeemed by the blood, you are a priest. You have direct access to the Father through the Son because of the blood of Jesus. You don't have to go through me. You don't have to go through Pastor Helen. You don't have to go through Lloyd or anybody else or, 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 or Holly or John Mark or any of, our, any of our other leaders. You don't have to go through them. You can go directly to the Lord 24-7. It doesn't matter where you are in the middle of the night. If something comes to harass you, you can dial up 911. You have the Four, 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 one, one, and it's Jesus. So what am I saying? I'm saying this, the priest, and you are all priests, they had this robe, and on the hem of it was the tinkerbells and the pomegranates. Now here's the deal. The tinkerbells are the sound. They're the flash. They're the pizzazz. Gifts. Every one of you have gifts. You don't earn them. You get them. When, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you get gifts. You didn't have to go work for it. What you need to do is develop it, okay? My goal as a five-fold leader is to help you identify that, develop it, expand it, grow it, and expand your sphere of influence in using it. Now, how do you know that's the thing that everybody sees often is the gifts? But in between was the pomegranates, which represent the fruit, which also represent the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because you have both gifts, but you need the fruit so that your character can match the gifting and the anointing on your life. So you have the capacity to handle that which God has given you. So though, the, so though the bells may sound, you need the pomegranates as well that represent the fruit. That's why the Bible says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 that you've been given love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, mercy, and self-control. Against such there is no law. That's right. So it's not an either or. We need to develop both. Right. And some will develop their gifting to the exclusion of their fruit 
Uh, if I fall down, just pick me up. To the exclusion of their fruit. And so what happens is it's out of balance. A lot of tinkle, not much fruit. We need both. Take that however you want it. <laughs> it's a good word, regardless of what. Now, you say, well, what's the big deal? The big deal is 1 Corinthians 12 talks about gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about gifts. But you have sandwich in between the pomegranate called love. Because that's the methodology. That's the motive wherewith we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not an either or. It's both. And everybody sitting here that is a redeemed child of God, you have both. It's up to you to develop both. Okay? So, now let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 13. Start at verse number 8. Here we go. It says this, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. What is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, note this, I put the ways of childhood behind me. I quit acting like a baby. I quit pooping my pants and potting my pants and tinkling or whatever else. And I began to grow up and I learned how to use the restroom. I learned how to feed myself. Okay, then it goes on and it says this. Verse 12, for now we see only a reflection as a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I will shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what, everybody? Love. Love. Agape. Remember, the Greeks had four words. They had the word, which is storge. It's a, a love that's just a, a love between friends. They had phileo, which is a brother love. It's a deeper form of love. Eros, which was not used in the Bible. It's a sexual love. Oh, that doesn't mean God doesn't want you to have sex. He does as long as you're married. And it's between a husband and a wife, and that's a man and a woman. <sighs> man, i got to clarify everything nowadays. <laughs> and then there's this word agape, from the root word agapeo, which means a love that expects nothing in return. That's tough sometimes, is it not? Let's get real here, everybody. Anybody in my camp, that's tough. But the reality is we've been admonished and we've been exhorted and we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. So that's the love that we're talking about. So the gifts operate out of this love. That is New Testament priests. It's not an either or, it's both. We have gifts and fruit being matched up so that we will minister out of a heart of love. I have three things that I want to talk about, three major points today, and that's love never perishes, number one. Number two, Jesus is perfection. And then number three, love is permanent. Now this thing about preeminence, let me give you a quick definition, is this, is that preeminence is the fact of surpassing all others. It is a superiority. And he's saying love has preeminence. When you go to Proverbs, the, the writer of Proverbs says, above all things get wisdom. It's the principal thing. Above rubies, gold, silver. And I like that. There's nothing wrong with this. But you know what? The preeminent thing is wisdom because wisdom enables you to know how to handle rubies, gold, silver, etc., and everything else. So you've got to get wisdom first. So that has a superiority to it. Now, when I love the outdoors, I love to fish, I love to hunt, I love to all do that, and so you'll have to forgive me if you don't do those things, but I really take seriously the word that says, all right, now I've given you all things as food. Did you know that says that in the Bible? And so we shoot, we eat, we fish, and we eat, and all that, or we make sure somebody's eating it. But there is a difference between, my son is really getting into fly fishing lately. He has a friend in Southern, Northern California who's a, who's a guide. So he's been teaching John Mark some things. And so John Mark's, he, you know, he picks up on something and he goes in whole hog. And, and he likes good stuff. He likes quality. Now, Dad, I could, I could put up with, you know, some junky equipment, but John Mark can't. And I'll tell you, there is a difference between a really nice fly rod and a junky fly rod. Right. There's a difference between a nice fishing pole and a Zebco 202. When I was a kid growing up, we all got Zebco's 202s. Why is that? Because you'd stomp on them, you'd break them, and, you know, all kinds of things. And they're indestructible, basically. So that's a good rod for a kid. But as you become more mature and you know what you're doing, you get a better fishing rod, a better quality. It costs more money. But you know what? The sensitivity is there. In the same way, this thing called love is supremacy. It's preeminence. It's the better quality stuff. 
And I want to tell you something. When you buy, let me just say this in terms of clothing or whatever, but when you may have less clothing, but if you buy good quality clothing, it will outlast the stuff that's cheap and falls apart that you have to go replace every couple of weeks. Thread, you pull a thread. You ever have a thread, you pull it, and the whole thing unwinds. Number one, love never perishes. Everybody say, never perishes. perishes. Now, when you think of perishing, you're thinking of something that begins to deteriorate, decay. Anybody like bananas? Bananas are awesome when they're ripe. Now, we have a bunch at the house that are green. You don't like to eat them because they don't really have the flavor. They're kind of hard. You wait till they get that nice, yellowy substance flavor, right? But have you ever noticed a banana that's gone bad? All of a sudden, it starts getting bruised and brown. And pretty soon you open it up, and it's like, ooh, there's a big yucky spot in it. And you bite it just like mush in your mouth. It's gone too far. It's perishing. What am I saying? Love never perishes. So take a look at me. It says in verse number, uh, let's go back to verse number 8. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. It will perish. Those three things. I'm a gift guy. I love the gifts. I love the operation of the gifts. We allow gifts to move in our service. We have gifts of prophetic word. These gifts are operating here in our church. We prophesy. We operate in tongues. We operate in word of knowledge. All those things are a part of our house. It's the culture of our house. We have no problem with that. But you know what he says? One day, there's coming a day, those things will will not be needed any longer. Now, it's not the time, but there's coming a day. So he's teaching on this whole thing about getting fruit ramped up in your life. So he says, number one, prophecies will perish. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 12, if you would, please. He says, prophecy at one point in time, at some point in time, it is going to cease existing. There's a teaching called the cessationist viewpoint that believes that prophecies are over with, tongues are over with, and things like that. That's, that cessation theology is losing ground. Did you know that? Uh-huh. Even in the major denominational camps, I don't know if you saw this recently, the Southern Baptists just uh-huh. came out and says, yeah. we're not going to get rid of our missionaries if they speak in tongues. Uh-huh. Woo, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take a look at Acts 12, pick it up at verse 24, last verse. It says... But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. And when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking them John, also called Mark, or John Mark, with them. In the, now in the church at Antioch, the, the thought continues. It doesn't stop. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping, just like we we're doing this morning, and then they had included fasting in this, the Holy Spirit said, how did he say it? Through a prophetic word through one of the prophets. But they were all in agreement with this. He says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. When I read the New Testament, one thing that I find oftentimes is when people were sent out from the mother church, it usually was with the mindset that all of them had an agreement. This is of God. We bless you. We send you. And it was a directional word. Amen. So one of the things that prophecy does, it does give direction. Another thing it does is that it brings confirmation. And this is my opinion now, but I believe that anything that God gives you prophetically ought to confirm what you already know in your heart. Now, there are some words that are foretelling that are yet to come that you may have no idea about that's yet future. You put those on the shelf and you say, Lord, if those are from you, I want them to come to pass. I will see as they unfold in time. But most prophetic words that you're going to get are going to confirm already that you know what's in your heart. And it just says, yeah, that's the answer of the two or three witnesses to give affirmation of something that you're doing. But he says, there's coming a time. You're not going to need that. Why? Because I'm going to show up on the scene and you're going to know as I know. But in the right now, it's part of what God's doing. So let's do it. Let's find out about it. Let's do it to the very best of our ability. Do I hear an amen? Amen. That's why we have prophetic people in our house. We want to release them to teach and to train and also that which I would know about. He says also tongues are going to, compar- they're going to perish. Tongues will perish. Go to Genesis chapter 11. Now, how many of you know when you're all talking the same language, you can get a lot more done? When you're not talking the same language, it's pretty difficult. Now, any of you that have traveled, uh, Sister Betty Basil, you've traveled, so you know what I'm talking about. Others, you've gone to foreign countries, you know what I'm talking about. When you go there, sometimes you're at a, diff- not sometimes, but you are at a disadvantage if you do not know the language. All you can do is point and say, I want that. Okay? I want that. 
or you need an interpreter to help you to get whatever you need to get done because they're interpreting what needs to be done. All right, with that in mind, take a look at Genesis 11. It says in verse number 1, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and for tar instead of mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that, note this, we may make a name for ourselves, otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Can I tell you something? Was that God's plan for them? No, No, because when you read the first thing, it says says that we were to replenish, multiply, and fill the earth. How many of you know you're not filling the earth when you're hanging out in this thing of a tower and building it up to heavens and being like the Most High God. They're in direct opposition to what God's saying. Now watch what happens. Take a look here. Keep on going. Verse 5, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people, that means in unity, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. That is in the natural, without any Holy Ghost anointing on it, in the very natural. He says, if they could speak one language and have their unified hearts together, they can accomplish much. Isn't it amazing? The great, uh, the great uh, things that have been found out and things that we have, uh, the, the sciences and the things that have taken place because people could get in agreement and accomplish something because they understood the language. Think about Bill Gates and the team that built Microsoft from the ground up in a garage, started in a garage. You can go down, to, you can go down to, to, to San Jose area and you can go to the very location. They have it now bought, I believe, and they have a kind of a display, the very garage where Bill Gates and their teams was a Steve Wozniak and their team that built this thing from the ground up. It's a, and he's the richest man in the world, multi-billionaire. Yeah, that's where he's at now, but he started down in California. Yeah, he did. Trust me. All right, so anyway, they have this whole Microsoft thing that's come up, and it's in Seattle now is where their home base is at. So what am I saying? I'm saying there's a mindset of agreement and one voice. So you're saying, okay, what's the deal? When the Lord scattered the language, they couldn't understand each other. They begin to go and break off and go every which way. And so they speak different languages. And you need to know that language. And so as they're speaking these different languages, you need the interpreter. But there's coming a day when, when Jesus comes again, that you're not going to need to speak in different languages. You're not going to have to have a tongue and interpretation of a tongue. And I'm for it. I'm for it. Are you hearing me? I am for tongues, the use of tongues. We had two of them last week in our Sunday service. There was a tongue and utterance in tongues and interpretation of tongues. There were two of them. They were in order. They were godly. They were of the Lord. We were blessed and benefited by them. But what is he saying? There's coming a day that it's not going to be needed any longer. We're all going to be speaking the same language. We're all going to be on the same page. I remember listening to John Corson. He pastors the Applegate Fellowship down in, uh, down in uh, where is it? Medford. Yeah, thank you. Medford, Cal- Med- Medford Oregon, uh, right down there. And I remember him telling a story. This is when he was young. He was in college, and they were meeting, I think, at a gathering place for a group of young guys, and they were studying the Bible. It was a retreat, and they had gone to a place that was like a retreat center, and there was a bar associated with it next to the meeting room. And it says, as we were there, somebody broke forth in an unknown language. And as they did, the guy that was back here behind the bar was another place. He says, all of a sudden, the guy began to weep and he began to cry because the tongue that had been given was in the native language of the guy that was serving, that was serving in that place. And he came over and he got convicted and he got saved because of that unknown language. But there's coming a day we're all going to be speaking the same language. Tongues will perish but we're all going to one day speak the same language. Then there's going to be words of knowledge. They're going to perish as well. Go to John, if you would, John chapter 1. Do you know that even Jesus operated in a word of knowledge? That's right. Now, remember, He is the Son of God, 100% God, 100% man. He left His omni powers. That means He did not rely upon them to do what He did. He was totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit. You also know that He did not move in miracle ministry until He was filled with the Holy Spirit at His baptism in the River Jordan. You all know this, right? This is theology I'm teaching you right now. And so it was only then for the next three and a half years that he moved in miracle ministry. Now take a look, if you would, please, and I believe also operated in the word of knowledge. Take a look at the book of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1, starting at verse 43. Here's what it says. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from here? Nathanael asked. So this is now them dialoguing. 
And then it goes on to say, come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So to this point in time, he did not have any contact with Nathanael. Had never talked with him. He didn't know him. All of a sudden, he sees him coming at him, and he speaks out, and he says, by word of knowledge, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I like that. I like that of people when they just are truthful people, when they're honest and forthright, when they tell you what they think. I appreciate that. Reminds me of when Helen and I first went to Roseburg years ago, and we tried out. We were like 20, what were we, 27, 28 was our first church. We'd been on staff at a church. We went down there, and we tried, in those days you tried out, so that means you preach, you preach your best sermon in the morning, you preach your next best sermon in the evening, then the people all took a vote on you, and they said yes or no. I needed a majority of the vote, which just means two-thirds majority. Well, basically, we got a super majority because we had all but two votes that voted for us. And then I knew who the one guy was. He wouldn't know who God was if God was sitting next to him, number one. But then the other person, we didn't know who it was. So that night, they had arranged for us to go home with this little white-haired lady. She was probably, what, in her late 70s, early 80s, I'm guessing. And she was going to host us at her house, and we were going to stay overnight there, and she was going to feed us and all that. So we walk in, and we put our stuff in the room that we've been assigned, and then we go in, and she's made a meal for us. And as she's made this meal, and we're sitting there eating, she looks at us, and she says to us, she says, I just want you to know, you know what? I'm one of those that did not vote for you tonight. <laughs> Her name, yeah, her name was Ruby Nelson. She, she says, the reason is, I just believe you're too young. You're just too young. You're too green. And, and we went on. We had a great history there at that church. And you know what ended up happening? We won her heart because we just were faithful and we were diligent, all those things. And we won her heart. And she became one of us, our closest confidence in that church. She never hid anything. If she had something to say, she didn't go behind your back and tell anybody else. She came direct away to talk to you about whatever it was. Come on. We need more of that in the body of Christ. We don't need anybody talking ill about anybody behind their backs. If you have something to say, you go tell them. Because that's, right. that's what the Bible tells us to do. In love. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to speak about that in a little bit. You're still in my thunder. <laughs> so what am I saying? I'm saying Jesus saw him. Now verse 48. How do you know me, Nathaniel? Asked and Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Well, how did he know that? He knew that by a word of knowledge. That's information given by the Spirit of God that you do not know about somebody that validates that what God is saying through you is of the Lord, that they're receptive to receive whatever God has for them. Can I say, some of you sitting here today, you will operate in the word of knowledge, and I believe it's going to be increasing. Some of you sitting here today, you're going to operate in a greater capacity of the prophetic word. I also believe that some of you sitting here today are going to operate in tongues and interpretation of tongues. Why? Because the time is still for that to operate in the here and now. Now, all of these gifts, remember the tinkle? They shine, they show, they need to be buffered by the fruit, which is the love. And the reason for this is always, the gifts always are for other people. It's not for you to say, whoa, look at me. No, it's to minister one to another. It's to edify and to build up the body of Christ. The reason we do what we do is always to edify others. Are you blessed by it? Of course you are. Amen. But it's always to encourage and edify that other person. These gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. All right, that's point number one. Love never perishes. It's never going away. Look at somebody say, it's never going away. Never going away. So you might as well get used to it and get your love quotient up. Get your love quotient up. If it's low, it's time to elevate your love quotient. Number two, Jesus is perfection. Go back to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look, if you would, please, at verse number 9, down through verse number 12. Jesus is perfection. So love, it never perishes. Jesus is perfection. We're talking about the preeminence of love, the superiority of it. It surpasses all others. Nine, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. So first thing we find out is that the gifts are partial. Okay, They're partial. One day they're going to come to an end. We will no longer need them. Now, how many of you know that a puzzle needs all the puzzle pieces to be complete? You ever gone through a phase where you go through a puzzle phase? Or you walked into somebody's house and on their, let's say their dining room table is a 
is a puzzle, and it's got the outline. How do you, how do you build a puzzle? You always start from the what? The outside, and you build in, don't you? You build the outside, the perimeter, and you always begin to build. And you'll go in, and you'll see this puzzle that's laid out. And, and I think we've probably all been through puzzle times where we've all had puzzles out, whatever, and have done them. And so you put them in. But you get to the end. Let's say you've built this puzzle, but there's one piece that's there. It's incomplete. It's partial. It's not fully filled. He says, well, that's kind of the way it is with gifts. It's partial. It's not in its fullness. Now, thank God that we are able to begin to, to grow, but they're partial. That means they're not going to be forever. They're, they're for this time. They're for this season. But there's coming a time they're going to end. Also, we recognize the reason that they're partial is because when they will fade away is when Jesus comes. Now, some would say, you know, this really talks about the completion of canon. That means in the first 100 years of the church, canon was complete. We call it a cessationist view because these gifts then cease to exist. Well, if that's the case, all of them would cease to exist. Right, right. So we want to pick and choose. We want to go like we're going up to the buffet table. Well, I only want this, but I don't want that. I want that, but I don't want that. You know, you go to Izzy's or you go to Hometown Buffet or whatever your favorite uh, uh, buffet joint is, and there's certain things that you get, and you'll pick this, and you'll pick that, you'll choose this, you'll choose that. But in this smorgasbord, it's all out there. We don't get to pick and choose. Well, I don't want that anymore. You know, I don't want that anymore. It's not cool or whatever, so I don't want that anymore. It's offensive, so I don't want that anymore. No, it's all available for today. But it is partial because there's coming a day that will not uh, need it again, and that's the day when Jesus comes Again, can I tell you, he is coming again. Go with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. We have got to realize there is coming a day that Jesus is coming again. I believe his appearing is nearer now than when we first believed. Verse 13. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Brothers and sisters, that's us, that's us-ins. We do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. It's amazing to me. I've done many, many, many funerals, many graveside services. I've done many um, services uh, in, in churches. I've done them in funeral homes, etc. But it always has amazed me, and is this, that it's usually the person that did not have the closest relationship with that individual that's usually the tore up the worst. They're boohooing the most. Now, I understand grief and emotions. Tears are normal. Did you know that? Right. It's an emotion. It's okay to cry. When you lose someone or something, you cry. That is normal. Right. A number of years ago, I talked about my dog earlier. Well, we, that's why I never wanted another dog because dogs, they just don't live long enough. You know, they live 12, 15 years at the long end, and they hurt you too much because they die. They're like your family. I mean, they come in, and they're a part of you. So years ago, we had our dog, Kanga, and for years when Helen said, honey, I want a dog, I want a dog, because I don't want no stinking dog. And then finally, I relented, and my boys were little, and we would go up to the river fish in the North Umco. We lived in Roseburg, and there was a guy there, and his daughter had given him two dogs, and so he couldn't have them both, and so he says, all right, I'm going to, would you guys like to have a dog? Well, Helen had been wanting a dog all along. I had the two boys. I says, well, sure, we'll take a dog, and he was half, he was half uh, Labrador and half uh, Springer Spaniel, so he was just a live wire. He had his tail docked. He was beautiful black and white patches on him and everything else. And so on the way back, I says, what are we going to name this dog? Matthew goes, his name's going to be Kanga. Now, you know, Matthew watches cartoons. You don't understand, kids. But there was a cartoon. It was Kangaroo. His name is Kanga. His middle name is Roo. And his last name is Taurus. So it was Kangaroo Taurus. That was our dog. <laughs> so we inherited his dog. I mean, he had all the shots, everything. I mean, it was perfect. He had papers, the whole works. And so, so we brought this dog home, big paw dads on him, everything else. I brought him home. And Helen goes, what in the world are you doing with that thing? And I said, oh, yeah, we got this dog. And I was telling her all the pluses. Well, why didn't you get a dog when I wanted a dog? I said, ah, anyway, you know, you've got you to work through all that, right? <laughs> so, so we're working through this thing. And then he became a part of our family. And he was ingrained in our family. And I told you the story earlier about, about John Mark into fly fishing. Well, when, I, when he was a little boy, we'd, I'd go out front. And that was when I first learned how to fly fish. And I'd practice in the front yard with just like yarn on the end of it, no hooks. And, I, and, and so John Mark would go out there. And he says, oh, he'd be practicing in the, in the front yard. He says, OK, no problem. My backyard, front yard, I think it was. And, and so I says, just don't put a hook on there because you're going to hook our dog. Because the dog would run over and he'd grab it, you know? You know how dogs are curious? <clears throat> so the next thing I know, I look out there, and John Mark comes in. He goes, Dad? Dad? I said, yeah, what? I hooked Kanga. I said, you hooked Kanga? Did you put a hook on that fly rod? Yeah, I put a fly on it. And Kanga got it. He's hooked in his mouth. So it was a big steelhead fly like that. 
So I went out there. Sure enough, here's my dog. Had a big old fly. It's like a green butt skunk in its lip right here. Pierced all the way through. And whenever he'd go like this, his, the, the fly would just go up and down like this. So if I knew what I know now, I just would have clipped that thing and pulled it out, no problem. But no, I had to take him to the vet and incur a vet fill and all that, you know, and everything else and clean it out, the whole shooting match. <coughs> but then we moved to Eugene. Kanga came with us. He's part of the family. And then he got sick one day. And I remember, here's, this is the, I remember being out with him one night, all night long in the garage. Finally had to take him to the, he just whined and cried. I laid down by him. And he just like, you know, he was like in pain. Can anybody relate to this stuff or am I the only one? So I took him to the vet next day. He was in the vet two days, and they says, now we're going to have to put him down. I'm like a big baby. I blubbered, and I cried. And so then he, they put him down, and we says, all right, we're going to have a burial for this dog. So we got him. I got the boys out of school. They were in school. My wife, she came home from work. We all packed in my pickup. We took off up to Mount Tom. If you know where Mount Tom is, it's right over here. There's a big swale in it right there. So we went up there, went around the back way, had to come in through shotgun, come up over the top, go in there, dig a hole, had him in his basket, had his toys, and I had to open up, look at him last time. And I said, the boys, you guys want to look at him last time? They're ruthless. No, we don't want to see him last time. Hal and I went over. We looked at it last time and closed it, and we started crying, and I buried him and everything else. Emotions are real. Right. Tears are real. Do you know there's coming a day there will be no more tears? Right. He'll wipe every tear away. Amen. But in the present, that is the reality. We have emotions. We hurt. We have emotional pain, and it's okay to cry. It's part of the process. But there's coming a time when Jesus comes again, there's going to be no more tears. There's going to be no more loss. Can I hear an amen? Amen. He says, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep, and that means they've died in him, according to the Lord's own word. This is not John's word. This is Jesus' words. We tell you that we who are still alive, that means if we're fortunate to be alive on planet Earth, when the rapture takes place, who are left until the coming of the Lord will cer certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, Hey! Hey, 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 hey! If you're nervous about loud voices, get over it. Heaven's going to be loud. There's going to be a loud voice. It says there's going to be the archangel. And it says the trumpet call of God. Do, 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 do. I don't know what it is. Trumpet call of God. It says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, where are the dead in Christ? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That means you're a tripart being. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. When you die, your spirit and soul exit the body. They either go to heaven or hell. Okay? Your body goes to wherever it is, whether it's ashes, whether it's in the earth or whatever, and there it stays until that day when the archangel shouts and the trumpet sounds what's happening. Those spirits and souls are coming back out of heaven. They're going to join into that body. So that's why I'm saying I don't care if it's in the deepest sea. I don't care if it's burned up in a pile somewhere. I don't care if it's ashes, wherever it is, or whether it's in the ground. And I'm not trying to be morbid or gross. I'm telling you, this is the reality of life. And you want to talk about the cycle of life, this is real. And it's going to inhabit those bodies once again they're going to be resurrected come on somebody they're going to be glorified bodies that can handle heaven they're going to shoot out of the graves they're going to rise up to meet the lord in the air that's what the word says that's what the word says that's what the word says and so shall we ever be with the lord how long forever Amen. Woo! Amen. yes Amen. therefore here's what we do in light of that encourage each other amen. with these words. Amen. I get to encourage you with these yeah, words. Amen. You get to encourage me with these yeah. words. I get to encourage you with these words. You get to encourage me with these words. So it doesn't matter if we exit this body before we think. What is happening is there's coming a day. This body is going to be changed. It's going to be glorified. No more tears. No more aches and pains. None of that stuff whatsoever. It is going to be able to handle the glory of Almighty God. Can you say amen? I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting to me. Amen. Woo! Thank you, Lord. So he says, when that happens, guess what? The gifts, we won't need them as we know them anymore. But in the present, we do. Therefore, today, go back to the book of 1 Corinthians 13. Look, if you would, please, at verse 11. He says, using an illustration now from childhood, 
When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me because I've grown up. There's been a process, a demarcation of change. We all here in the Western worldview, basically most people, not everybody, but most, go to school, and it goes through a graduated process. You go into kindergarten, well, even preschool. Now you have preschool. Kids are learning to read, write, do colors, tie their shoes, all those things in preschool. It took me till I was five to learn how to tie my shoes. I remember it distinctly. I was at Horace Mann grade school the first year. The second year, I moved to Robbinsdale. Spent the rest of my life there. But I remember sitting in a teepee. They had a big teepee, and they taught me how to tie my shoe in a teepee. I don't know why you, there's certain things that just stick out in your mind. Here I am in a teepee learning to tie my shoes. I've been tying them ever since. Must have taught me good, right? <laughs> Some of you may have learned to do that before that. Now they got Velcro everything, so you don't even need to tie anything anymore. It's like slip-ons and Velcro, right? <laughs> but that was that era. But if I'm still learning how to tie my shoes, something's wrong. Okay? So it's a graduation process. So I'm growing up. How many of you know you need to grow in the gifts? You need to grow in the fruit. It's a process of development and change and putting yourself in positions whereby you can learn to do that. It's also being given opportunity to that. I taught, we, t we were teaching the other night in Supernatural School of Ministry. I says, you know what? I remember a guy, and we, we were in church, and he was, he's really a, 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 a recognized prophetic prophet today. But I says, I remember when we were, he was older than I was, but we were in college at the same time. He'd been in the military, came back, and we were in college. And I remember a Sunday morning that he'd given utterance in tongues. There was no interpretation of tongues. And the pastor just says, you know, that was out of order because there was no interpretation. Basically, if you, if you have the tongue, you should be able to interpret it. That's the Bible. And, and it was a process in front of all these hundreds of people. I'm going, oh, man. I know mean, that's not the environment you want to be learning in. You want to be learning in a smaller environment where you learn to make mistakes that you can begin to grow and develop. So we want to give and afford those opportunities for people to do that. Says, it's time to grow up. In these things, go with me to the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 4, one of my favorite passages of scriptures, because it's all about the church. It's all about how the church functions, all about how the church should, should operate, move, and minister. This is the thunder that Joseph was trying to steal from me earlier. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Here's what it says. So Christ himself gave, this is Jesus now giving to the body of Christ, apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers. Here's the reason why. Here's the reason why the fivefold gift exists. It's to equip people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. You know, what happened is, is that the church has really done a disservice to itself, and leaders have done a disservice to themselves by basically saying, I'm called to do everything, and you guys just sit and watch. We're all called to do stuff. The reason that we're here today really is this is really a training time. This is a rah-rah session. Did you not know that? Yeah. This is a rah-rah time. We're coming in here to worship the Most High God for you to get elevated, you to get encouraged, you to get built up, you to get taught and trained, that you then go out into the real harvest field, into your sphere of influence, and minister where God has sent you in your harvest field. Yeah, that's, true. that's the mission field. This is the training, the, the equipping ground, that if you see somebody sick or somebody that needs Jesus or needs help or assistance, that's you. You're the, you're the one that's been sent to go do that. I'm equipping you to do that. I'm giving opportunity and facilitating that to happen. That's my job. It's to teach you, it's to train you. It's like a daddy teaching and training his kids how to do what they need to do so that they can grow up, how to tie their shoes, how to brush their teeth, how to use deodorant, how to comb their hair, how to put hairspray on, how to shave. Man, you know, it's like when you first learn how to shave. Guys have to learn how to do that. I think girls have to learn how to do that too because they shave their legs, or they should anyway. This isn't France. I don't know if you know that or not. I won't go any further than that. I'm leaving that one alone. <laughs> Those are just practical things we do, but we think, oh, that's just, that's just natural. But as in the natural, so in the spirit, you've got to learn how to do this stuff. He then says, going on, to equip the people for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up. Built up. Everybody say built up. Note this, until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. This is what I like because this is really what Genesis 11 is all about, should they have done it right, the right way. In unity, one accord, one voice, but going and doing what God asked them to do throughout the four corners of the earth. They didn't. He then says, going on, to be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God becoming mature. There it is, tell you, 
Some of your versions, if it's King James, has the word perfect, but it's actually mature because I don't believe you'll see perfection this side of heaven. Did you know that? That's right. Now, it's your quest, it's your goal, but you won't be perfected when you see Christ face to face. And then he says, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, now what will happen when we do this? When we become mature, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. That means every new thing that comes down the pike doesn't mean it's of the Lord. Now, does God breathe on certain things in seasons? Of course he does. But that doesn't mean everything that's happening is of God, and we need to be discerning about that. Verse 15 instead, here it is, speaking the truth in love, like Ruby Nelson did to Helen and I, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body, that means collectively, of him who is the head, that is Christ, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in what, everybody? In what? In what? In love, as each part does its work. We build each other up in love. So we're all doing our gifted things, the tinkle bells, the sound, da-da-da-da. And by the way, they say that they they would move in harmony. But at the same time, it's the pomegranate, it's the fruit, it's the love that motivates it and that we're getting along and we're liking each other and we're encouraging each other and we become the family that God desires for us to be accomplishing together, which we could never do. And as an individual, we do it collectively by worshiping the Lord ministering one to another, reaching the lost, and advancing the kingdom of God throughout the world. Do I hear an amen? Amen. That's what we're about. So how long does this go on until we see him face to face? Go back to the book of 1 Corinthians 13. Take a look, if you would, please, verse number 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. How many of you know that we prophesy in part? We move in gifts in part. We don't always have the full deal. Now, having said that, what's he saying about when I see him as in a mirror, as face to face? You must understand that as he's writing to the church at Corinth, Corinth was a center, a place that had bronze mirrors. It was known for its bronze mirrors. In other words, they don't have mirrors like we have today that are very clear. You can see and it looks like it, it is. Their mirrors were bronze. So what they would do is they would shine it, but they were the pristine ones that they could find. But still it was like dimly. It wasn't fully like you should see. So he's making an analogy. Though we see that way now, there's coming a day when we're really going to know. And you say, what does that mean? I just believe it doesn't matter what movement a person is a part of. I don't care if it's Baptist, I don't care if it's Lutheran, Methodist, Spirit-filled, Charismatic, Pentecostal. I really believe we're all going to see as really we need to see in the fullness. Do you know none of us has the, the premium on all the, all the, the truth? That's right. That's exactly right. When you think you're the only one, man, you're in trouble. Amen. If you think, I got on the repository of all the truth, I'm the only one who knows something, give me a break. You're on a precipice to <laughs> tip over. And nobody can teach you anything. Look at somebody say, he's not talking about you right now. He's talking about somebody else. (laughs) I still don't know all I need to know. I remain teachable. So does my wife. So does anybody that is called to do the king's bidding. All right. So you see this mirror, and it's there. But there's coming a day the full expression of the Godhead will be seen. Go to the book of uh, what I have down there. Do I have it down there? Exodus 33. If you're here Wednesday, Paul touched on this a little bit. Exodus 33. By the way, we had an awesome meeting on Wednesday night. Oh, yeah. Just power of God came, great worship, s- saturated in the glory. And Take a look, if you would, please. Jump down to verse number 19, Exodus 33, 19. Everybody still awake? Yeah. Nudge your neighbor. Say, we're going to get there. <laughs> yeah, sometime. <laughs> All right, here we go. Verse 19, and the Lord said, I will cause... So here's the deal. Moses knows he's called to lead the children of Israel. But he's the, the Lord's saying, I don't really want to go. He says, Lord, if you don't go, I ain't going. 
If you don't go, I'm not going. That's just the way it is. got to go with me. And I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. Does anybody want to see the glory of God? I want to see the glory. I want to see the glory. Here's what happens. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness, all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I'll proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on who I have compassion. Verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see my face and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock where my glory passes by. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now, what is he saying? We want to see the glory of God. We may not see him as fully as we can, but there's coming a day that we will, according to this, see him fully as he is. We may be looking at that mirror dimly right now, but there's coming a day that clarity will be unleashed and the glory of God will be made manifest in a permanence. Now we see waves. It comes in and we get a measure of it and it goes out. But there's coming a day when Jesus comes that we will know as he is known. We will see him face to face and we will be in his presence. Why? Jesus is perfection. So love never perishes and Jesus is perfection. Finally, number three, we recognize that love is permanent. Love is permanent. It never will cease to exist. Go back to the book of 1 Corinthians 13. Look at verse number 13. And this final point, it says this, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what, everybody? Love. love. So these three remain. They're remaining right now. How many of you know they're here right now? How many of you know we need faith? Yeah. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Everybody sitting here, you accepted Jesus Christ by faith. You got baptized in the Holy Spirit by faith. You get a miracle by faith. You get a healing by faith. You get deliverance by faith. You trust in that which has already been accomplished through Calvary's cross by faith. You lay hold of it says it's mine in the now because faith is always in the now. If you've been prayed for, I don't care if you've been prayed for a hundred times, Debbie, we're going to contend for your eyes. No macular degeneration in Jesus name. I don't care if you had heads, hands laid on you till your head is bald. We're going to continue to contend. Why? Because I believe that the previous prayers were efficacious. That means they had effect. There's a seed that was sown because the word is like seed and we agreed with the seed and we laid hands in faith and we agree with the seed and there was a portion that was released. What we're doing is we're waiting for the full manifestation of that thing in your life and it may not even be until Jesus comes but if it doesn't we're going to contend for that to be made manifest in the empirical physical realm in which we live. Do I hear an amen? amen? Yes. That's what we do. We take it by faith. How many of you know it is impossible to please God? The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it is impossible to please God without faith. But he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I'm seeking you, Lord. I'm seeking you. Whatever I receive, I receive by faith. That's the realm that God wants us to move and operate. It's the realm of the Holy Spirit. It's the realm of faith. It's going to remain. So is hope. It's going to remain. Go with me to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Last week in our men's Bible study Monday, Mondays, men's Mondays at McDonald's. We're teaching out of Titus. Titus chapter 1. Here's what it says, verse 1-1. One, one. Paul, a servant of God, again a doulos, a bond servant, and an apostle of Jesus Christ has sent one, one who establishes, one who establishes things, of Jesus Christ, that means the Savior, the Anointed One, to further the faith of God's elect. That's us. And their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In the, Note this, verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. Do you know that eternal life was planned before the beginning of time? Yeah. Do you know that God's a planner? Yeah. This is in His grand scheme and plan. In which now is his appointed season, he is brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Listen, you can have hope. It's not always going to be like this. There is coming a day that we'll be the inheritors of that which has been prepared for us, that we truly will get to one day join the assembly of heaven, the 24 elders that are bowing down. There are 12 that represent the old tri- the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 that represent the apostles of the land, and that they begin to bow down, that heaven is a place of worship and adoration in His presence, His fullness of joy and life forevermore. Right now as we're sitting in this place, Jesus is in the midst of us. Did you know that? He is here in the here and now. There's coming a time that 
that we will then also be with them in that heavenly realm where it says they bow down and they worship and they cast their crowns saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the, and the earth is full of His glory. I'm telling you, saints, His glory will incapacitate that all we can do is worship Him. That we long for the day that we become so incapacitated. We become like the book of Chronicles. When they dedicated the temple on that day, they all fell out on their faces because the glory was so strong in the house. How many of you know when that happens, you don't need anybody laying hands on you to get healed? Now, we're not against that. We're for that. But I'm just telling you, God can heal you in His glory. You can just be in His presence. Boom, it takes place. Our hope remains. There's the return of Christ and the eternal life that is ours in Him. And then lastly, we recognize that this love remains. You want to know why it remains and it will always remain? There you go. Go to 1 John. You get this, the gold star for that one. 1 John chapter 4. Start, if you would, please, at verse number 7. Look at somebody say, he really is almost done. Okay, here we go. Verse 7, dear friends, this is John writing to the church dispersed. Dear friends, let us love who? Okay. Sometimes does that take a little bit to do that? Okay. There have been times my wife has said to me, honey, I love you, but I don't like you very much right now. Well, the feelings were mutual too. At that time, at that time. At that time, long, long time ago. <laughs> Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from who, everybody? So it comes from God. That's why I got to have a relationship with them, because true love is only going to come that way. Agape cannot be, do you know this? Agape love cannot be exhibited by a non-believer. Biblical agape cannot be exhibited by a non-believer, because it comes to a relationship with God. They can have Storge, they can have Eros, and they can have Philadelphia, but they cannot have agape, true agape love. <clears throat> Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Isn't that just what it said? Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is, here it is, everybody, love. He is the epitome, the embodiment, the personification of love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son. Note this, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved so, since God so loved us, we also ought to love who? One another. No one has ever seen God. That's the face-to-face -face part. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. I want to keep reading. Are you all right with that? Yeah says, verse 13, this is how we know that we live in Him and that He in us. He has given us the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, large case S. And we know that, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God, lo God lives in Him and they in God. And we also know that we rely on God, the love God has for us. Verse 16, continuing on. God is love. There it is again. God never repeats something for the sake of Him knowing it. He already knows who He is, but He's letting us know that. God is love. Everybody say this with me. God is love. God is love. Say, God is love. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how we, this is how we will, uh, this is how we love, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. Get a hold of that. That's a deep revelation. Underline it. Meditate on it. You got to go home and think about that for a little bit. Amen. There, is, there is no fear in love. Now, I want you to get this. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect or matured in love. Mm -hmm. wow. That's what it says. We love because He first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and 
their sister. I'm concluding with this statement quoted from the Reformation Study Bible. The indispensable mark of the Christian life is Christian love. The measure and test of love to God is wholehearted obedience in the scriptures there to back that up. The measure, I think that bears repeating. The measure and test of love to God is wholehearted obedience. God, I'll do that, but I won't do that. God, I'll do this, but I won't do this. I'll do that, but I won't do that. Wholehearted obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed better than the fat of rams, according to 1 Samuel 15. The measure and test of love to our neighbors is laying down our lives for them. 1 John 3, 16, John 15, 12, and 13. See, this stuff that I teach here has to be actualized, lived out. The rubber meets the road in everyday life. Otherwise, we're here, and it's all good stuff, and you're amen, and, and I'm having a good time because I'm doing what I've been called to do. But the real test of it is, how does it play out in everyday life? That's, right. That's really it. How does it play out in everyday life? Right. So the gifts operate through love. The test of my love for God is by my obedience to Him. When you become a pastor and you've been at it as long as I have, your circle of non-church people diminishes. That means it grows smaller and smaller and smaller. That means I purposely put myself in environments where non-believers are at so that I have opportunity to minister to them. So it happens through my outdoor activities. It happens really wherever I go. And it happens through my daily routines. You all know I go work out at a spa, pretty much uh, uh, a gym, pretty much three times a week, sometimes four. If I'm really on, it's five. That's what I like. That's my goal, but it's usually not that. Typically three, four. I have a fellow pastor friend of mine who joins me. We're accountability partners, build each other up, encourage each other, share each other, all that kind of stuff. So we hang out together. I've known him for a long, long time. And, um, but that becomes our sphere to reach the lost, to touch people that don't know Jesus. You know how many people I've invited to our church or ministered to or prayed for or shared faith for or given words or whatever? It's past Tuesday. We're sitting in the sauna, so we work out the weights. Then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, men's sauna day, we were in the sauna. So we're in there, and as I'm in there, there's a guy that's sitting up in the corner. We just engage people in conversation. And uh, so I was, I was uh, talking to this young man. He's 41. And he began talking, and immediately the Holy Spirit says, you need to pray for him. He began to talk, and he says, yeah, I have a broken foot. I'm off work right now. I've got, I'm on disability right now. I'm on workman's comp because I, I fractured my foot. And at first they just thought it was hurt, but kept pain, pain, pain. So this type of job, he's on his feet, up and off, his feet off of a piece of equipment. And he says, finally, they realized it was broken, and now I'm going through a whole process of that. He says, but the real problem is I have degenerative discs. He says, I have four of them in my neck, and they're all disintegrating. It's genetic. It's hereditary. He's 41. That's way too young for that to happen. Did you notice the genetic part? The Bible says in the book of... Where does it say that? Thank you. Exodus 20. The sins of the fathers are passed to the third and fourth generation. Excuse me. That's not right. It says that, yes, it is. The sins of the fathers are passed to the third and fourth generation. That means it becomes down the line. But the blessing to the thousandth generation of those that love me and are called in court to my purpose. It's Exodus 20, verses like 3, 4, and 5 right in there. Curse to the third and fourth generation. That means if something was incurred by the enemy because it had place, had access, it passes on. That can be broken, by the way, if you're here. We did that a couple Amen. of weeks ago. Yeah. But he says, he says, but to the thousand generation blessing. Amen. I'm just praying over my generations, however long it is until the Lord comes, blessing. You got to do this. You got to do the same. So we got his name and his age. He's 41. And I just couldn't take it anymore. You know how all of a sudden this builds and builds and, you know, right. you, yeah. for me at some point I know it's time to engage. 
Now, let me just tell you, sometimes you earn the right to be heard, and sometimes you're prompted supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. This is your opportunity. You've got to take it. So there's two ways to do this. I'm training you right now, just so you know. Because there are times I'll build relationship in this process, and then I have opportunity to share. There are other times that it's, boom, the Holy Spirit says, now, pull the trigger, because this is the right moment. The anointing's on it, and you just share what you've got to share. So he says, we cannot go, and I says, I says, first of all, I stood up and says, you know, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord? Well, no, not really or whatever. Well, he doesn't, but that doesn't dissuade me. I said, oh, that's it. I go, I said his name, and I says, you know what, I really, really feel like we need to pray for you. Can we do that? And he goes, well, sure. And he goes, and by the way, because after I said that, he goes, and by the way, I mean, this got, it got worse. He goes, seven years ago, my son who was two and a half years of age died. I mean, could it get any worse? I mean, I'm like, are you kidding me? So I just prayed for him right there in the sauna in the name of Jesus, that the Lord would heal his foot, the Lord would heal his neck, the Lord would take away the pain of his loss. And I says, because this is not what God's intent for you was, but it's what reality is. Lord, in the midst of all this, heal him, restore him, and let him know that you're a good God, that you're for him, and you want to work in his life. See, this stuff has to work in everyday life. Love, and the gifts operate through love. It's not an either-or. It's both. That's right. It's both. 